1 John 3, 1 through 10. And the King James today reads in this fashion. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. This is probably one of the most confusing passages. This passage is probably one that says more that boggles the mind of most believers than any passage in the Word of God. And I hope today by the end of this message you will have a clear understanding of what the Apostle John was trying to say. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you, God, and we thank you. For the word of the Lord, we thank you today, God, for the Spirit of God, which lifts us up, inspires us, encourages us. Even as we sing the great old songs of the church, we're reminded that one day, by and by, we'll understand it better. Master, today anoint the messenger. Anoint as well, O God, the ear of every hearer. Allow those today, Lord, who would watch, who would listen, both live and by reason of the internet, allow them, Lord, to receive the word of God that it might bring forth fruit unto righteousness in their lives. Today, O oh God, by your Spirit, till up that hardened ground and pull up the stones and the stumps that would try to interfere with growth and development in our lives and in our spirits. Master, in the name of Jesus, move mightily through your word, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Uh, Tommy, the screen's frozen again on the YouTube. It's been frozen for several minutes. It's still moving on Facebook. Uh, okay, good. Uh, it, if right. you just unplug and replug the USB thingy, that'll probably fix it. Yeah, it's stuck on YouTube. I want to talk to us for t today for a while on the topic, not as simple as black and white, 
not as simple as black and white. Many Christians embrace a very simplistic, legalistic view of the Word of God. If you approach the Word of God with a legalistic mindset, then you will read everything as law. This is why you often hear legalistic Christians say, it's as simple as black and white. How often have you heard someone who claims to be a Christian say, it's as simple as black and white. You know, to them they read words on a page and they claim that, you know, uh, there is no question. It says plainly here, therefore there is no question. It's as simple as black and white. Well, I'm here to tell you today, it is not as simple as black and white. According to them, the answers are plainly printed in the pages of God's holy book. But the problem is not in what is written, but rather in how it is read. This is why today it is so important that we get our theology right so that we can read the Word of God through the clear lens of grace and not the clouded, biased, deceitful lens of law. There have always been great confusions within Christian theology over passages that read as our primary text today reads. But the confusion can easily enough be dispelled when we rightly divide the Word of God and look at the whole rather than simply concentrating on the part more confusion is brought into the church by careless examination of a part, ignoring how it is that this part fits into the whole. No single passage of Scripture contains a message entirely self-contained within itself but rather it is part of the greater puzzle. When we fit all the pieces together, we can clearly see the picture that the Lord desires we see and understand. In Isaiah 28, 9 through 13, the Word of God reads, Whom shall he teach knowledge? Meaning God teach knowledge. And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. Meaning those who are mature, those who have grown up. Not babies, not simple minded people who are still children in their understanding. Verse 10, Isaiah 28. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. So, so through the prophet Isaiah, God makes it abundantly clear that he has purposely chosen a method of communication 
that requires one be weaned, that requires one no longer be feeding on mother's milk. You gotta grow up, you gotta mature, you gotta have a mind to understand if you're gonna truly understand the Word of God. If you think like some kind of a simple-minded ding a -ling, then you're just going to read the Word of God, bless God, and have no education and have no understanding and have no maturity, spiritually or otherwise, and you're going to be able to understand what you're reading. The Word of God itself tells us you are wrong. It's not as simple as black and white. In Isaiah, God said it's line upon line. And then he repeats that line upon line. Precept upon precept. And then he repeats that precept upon precept. Repetition in Hebrew is a means of uh, adding an exclamation point to a statement. So when you read line upon line and comma line upon line, precept upon precept, comma, precept upon precept. That is God putting an exclamation point behind that phrase. Meaning, this is important. God isn't just saying to us, it's line upon line, precept upon precept. He is yelling that at us. If you're going to get this thing, if you're going to My goodness, it's line upon line. It's precept upon precept. It's here a little and there a little. So in order to understand what God is saying, you've got to be able to look at the whole and bring the entire picture together and understand how this statement over here could possibly uh, coincide with this statement over here. Oftentimes, we read things in the Word of God. You know, it makes me laugh how Christians will defend the notion that there are no contradictions in the Word of God. I grew up fundamentalist. Oh, I tell you what, bless God, let somebody tell me that the Word of God contains contradictions. And oh, I'm supposed to fight with them, you know, tooth and nail, defending the Word of the Lord. There are no contradictions in the Word. Well, of course there are. Of course there are. Say, Pastor, you're not supposed to say that. Well, maybe I'm not, but I did. You see, there are contradictions, listen to me, children, if you read the part without trying to understand how the part fits into the whole. If you read the whole with maturity, if you rightly divide the Word of God, then you're able to understand how two statements that appear to contradict one another, in fact, don't contradict one another at all. But they're saying something different than it appears they're saying in simple black and white. You say, give me an example. Okay, the Word of God said, judge not least to be judged. Then later the Apostle Paul comes along and says, what? Are you not judging? Don't you know the saints will one day judge the angels? Am I telling the truth? Yes, I am. So you've got two different things here that appear to be contradictory. But then, in another place, the Apostle Paul said, Let us not judge one another anymore, but judge this rather. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, wait a minute. So in one place, Paul appears to be agreeing with what the Lord said concerning judge not, don't sit in judgment one. Yet there's another place where it appears as though 
He is contradicting what the Lord said entirely and completely. He's going completely opposite to what the Lord said. But the reality is that not every time in the English translation of the Bible, when you read the word judge, not every time is it being translated from the same Hebrew, Greek, Chaldee word. Sometimes the King James translators would use the same word to translate a number of different terms in the original text. So therefore, and it's not, they weren't wrong. It wasn't a matter of being wrongfully uh, translated. No, in their day, the English language was less complicated and less diverse than it is today. They didn't have the same vocabulary available to them, you know, so many hundreds of years ago that we have available to us today. So they used the term that they felt best fit, you know, that best served the purpose. But the reader, even in the King James era, understood that this word judge doesn't necessarily mean the same thing every time you read it. Am I telling the truth? Amen. So when they would read it, they would have to say, okay, now wait a minute, this would appear to contradict what it says here, what it says there. So is it possible then that this term here does not mean the same thing as judge over here and judge over here? Could it be that in this text it means use right judgment? Boy, I'm going to tell you, there's a world of difference between judging mm -hmm. and using right judgment. You've got to use right judgment when you drive your car. Mm -hmm. You've got to judge the distance between the car coming at you and how fast it's coming and whether or not you've got room to pull out in front of it without causing a wreck. Am I telling the truth? Did you hear what I just said? You've got to judge. Now, I'm not misusing the word judge when I say that. I'm using the word as it was meant to be used. You've got to make a judgment. But am I talking about judging in the same way that you would judge your neighbor or you would judge your friend? No, it has a completely different application and a completely different meaning. In the instance of judging in terms of driving, I'm speaking of using proper judgment. Do you follow what I'm saying? So you see, it's imperative that God's people grow up. Quit acting like babies. Immature, ignorant, foolish, unlearned, uneducated children. It's time they grow up and realize that not everything is black and white. Not everything you read is as simple as saying what it appears to say. Hello now. Sometimes it's saying something important, but it has to be balanced against the rest of God's Word. In our primary passage today, 1 John chapter 3, Verses 1 through 10. The Apostle John is in essence saying this. Listen to me. Believers can do no wrong. That's what John is really saying. Now we just read that passage. It sounds like John is saying. It reads like John is saying that Christians are incapable of sin. And that if a Christian sins, then really they're not a Christian to begin with. That's what it sounds like 
John is saying am I telling the truth when most Christians read that passage they come under the weight of guilt they come under the weight of condemnation they come under the weight of self conviction because it reads a certain way it appears to say that Christians are incapable of sin but let me ask you a question what Christian in their right mind what believer who honestly can look at themselves and their own lives can honestly say that they're incapable of sin. But now here's the thing. This is what I mean about line upon line, precept upon precept. Elsewhere in his writings, in his epistles, the Apostle John, the same author of this exact passage that we're using today as our primary text, the same exact author says, if we say that we have no sin, then we're calling God a liar, and the truth is not in us. What? What? Wait a minute, John. You told us over here in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, that Christians are incapable of sin. Now you're telling us that if we claim that we're sinless, we're calling God a liar and the truth is not in us. Am I telling the truth today? But what John is really saying in our primary text today is not that believers are incapable of sin but listen carefully to what I'm going to say but rather he is saying believers can do no wrong say well pastor that means the same thing no it doesn't listen to me now that is not to say that they are incapable of doing wrong or committing sin Listen, but rather that in the eyes of the Lord, His children can do no wrong. Hallelujah. Oh, there's a difference. There's the difference. It's not that we're incapable of sin. It's not that we're incapable of doing wrong. But rather that in the eyes of God, as believers, as those who have embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ by faith, God no longer sees us as being capable of wrongdoing. You ever seen a parent who had a kid and man that kid could drive you up the wall. That child could about make you half crazy. But if you look at mom or dad while that kid's acting like the devil, they're sitting there with a big stupid grin on their face. Isn't Johnny adorable? Isn't he cute? Isn't he so sweet? And you're thinking to yourself, yeah, give me a board and I'll beat the good into him, right? Because that kid's driving you up the wall. But see, mom and dad aren't looking at that kid the same way you're looking at him. I got news for you. When we believe the gospel, when we embrace this faith, when we trust in Jesus Christ for our salvation, His righteousness, listen to me children, His righteousness becomes our possession. Hallelujah. By faith we possess his righteousness. Therefore, when God looks at us, all God sees is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah to God. God's people can do no wrong in the eyes of God. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. What John was saying was, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 through 10, he was saying, it isn't hard to tell the difference between a child of God and a child of the devil. It isn't hard to tell the difference between a sinner and a saint. It's not that sinners, excuse me, saints are perfect and sinners are not perfect. No, that's not the difference. The difference is, Saints do something that sinners don't do. 
Now they may do a lot of the same things, but saints do something that sinners don't do. What is that? They do righteousness. Oh, hallelujah. You see, if you're really born again, if you're truly a child of God, it's not that you're incapable of sin or incapable of wrongdoing in the sense of you're not, uh, it's not within your ability to do those things. No, that's not what it means. But listen, but believers, children of God, they may do a lot of wrong things, but listen to me now. There's something else they do that sinners don't do. And that is, they do a lot of right things. Oh, hallelujah. Righteousness literally means right. They do right. They strive to do right. They try to do right. Right. Does that mean they never fail? No. Does that mean they never fall? No. Does that mean they never slip? No. Does that mean they never sin? No. But it means that as you look at their lives, they are really genuinely, clearly trying to do right. Got news for you, children. Going to church and being part of a fellowship and being part of the family of God is part of the right that God looks for in His people. That's why John ended his comments in, in 1 John 3, 1 through 10 with that we also do what? We love the brethren. I'm going to tell you something. God's people don't have to be perfect for me to love them. I've been part of a lot of churches in my life. I've been a member of any number of churches. I've pastored any number of churches. Got to tell you, there have been people in every church I've ever been part of. There have been people there who drove me up the wall. There have been people there who, uh, you know, made me a wreck. There have been people there who really tried my patience at times. But you know what? Just as I have blood family that some sometimes get on my nerve and sometimes annoy me and sometimes drive me crazy but I still love them anyway because they're family the same thing is true of the house of God I don't quit going to church because oh, there are too many hypocrites there are too many people that oh, they act like they're Christian but they're not, they're not really living a Christian life blah, 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 blah. Well, honey, got news for you. That ain't the only church on the planet you can attend. Mm -hmm. So your excuse is empty. It's hollow. In other words, let the pastor put it to you real plain. You're full of crap. Using that old excuse not to go to church. That's garbage. There are thousands of churches out there. And if you're going to do the right thing, the Word of God teaches us that we're to be part of the family. We're not to isolate ourselves from the rest of the family. We're not to separate ourselves from the rest of the family. Part of growing spiritually is overcoming the obstacles that present themselves as we're striving to be part of the family of God. I've told people, I don't know how many times, I've had people come to our church and they say, well, I don't want to come to church anymore because I can't stand that person over there. I can't stand this person. and They just make me not even want to come to church. And I'll explain to them. Let me tell you a little secret. You're overcoming that issue between you and them that is part of what God is trying to teach you. That's part of what the Lord is trying to help. He's trying to help you step up to a higher level. He's trying to help you grow spiritually and emotionally and psychologically. So therefore, avoiding church because of that person, all you're doing is walking away from a lesson rather than learning what you're supposed to learn. Oh, it would be easy for me, a lot of times, be easy for me to ask certain people not to come back to church, to ask certain people not to be part of our church. But you know what? That's not where the lesson is for me. Amen. 
I've got to love them in spite of themselves. I've got to find a way to be able to love them in spite of themselves. Well, what good is it in learning how to love somebody in spite of themselves? Well, I'll tell you what's good in it. As you learn to love people in spite of themselves, you learn to understand how come God can love you in spite of you. I don't know how many times I've had to try to love somebody in spite of themselves. And then after a while, I'll step back and I'll think and I'll realize, you know, Lord, that must be what you go through with me sometimes when I'm acting the fool. That must be what you go through with me sometimes when I'm not acting like God to act. Because in your eyes, I can do no wrong. So somehow, Lord, you find a way to look past my failure, to look past my sin, to look past my, my falling, to look past my weakness and you find a way to love me anyhow do you hear what I'm telling you now oh there's a lesson to be learned every church member we interact with every difficult relationship that we struggle with when it comes to members of God's family every one of those experiences is teaching us lessons and helping us to better ourselves and to become better because honey if you can't love to learn to love the unlovable then according to Jesus, you're no better than the world because even in the world, they love those that love them back. Am I telling the truth? Everybody can love the people who are easy to love. The greatest Christians I've ever known in my life, I've talked about them, I don't know how many hundreds of times. Brother and Sister Gillum, Brother and Sister Goodman, these are people who could love anybody. I mean, they had a reputation for being the most loving, caring, giving, compassionate people on the planet. They could love anybody. And you know what? That is the example of what Jesus wants to help every one of us to become. Am I telling the truth? He said, love your enemies. Well, if he wants us to love our enemies, honey, if you can't even love the people in the church who believe like you do, they may act wrong. They may do stupid things. But you share something in common with them that's very important. If you can't even love members of your own family in, in the faith, then how in the world are you ever going to love your enemies? But you see, Christians are not those who walk perfectly, but Christians are those who do something that the world, the unbelieving world, doesn't even try to do. And what is that? They try to do right. Do you understand the difference today? Oh my goodness. Got news for you. God sees what you do right far more quickly. Listen to me, children. God sees what you do right far more quickly than He sees when you do wrong. Hallelujah. According to the Apostle John, The children of God can do no wrong. We've all heard it said of someone who enjoys special, unconditional favor afforded them by a parent, a guardian, a boss, or a superior. Oh, you know, so-and-so can do no wrong by that boss, or so-and-so can do no wrong by his parents, or by his uh, guardian. When this is said, it is not meant to suggest that that individual is incapable of wrongdoing, but rather that in the eyes of certain individuals, that person is incapable of doing wrong. Am I telling the truth? In 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10, this then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you 
that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, listen to this next phrase, we have fellowship one with another. Oh. You know why we're part of a church? Do you know why you belong to a church? Because if you walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Oh my goodness. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His Word is not in us. It's in the same epistle. Our primary text is chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. I've just read to you chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. He begins the epistle by saying, if we say we have no sin, we're calling God a liar. We're deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. But in chapter 3, he says, believers can do no wrong. Do you see why it's not as simple as black and white? You see why it's important to rightly divide the Word of God? You see why God has said it's line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little? John makes it clear that sin is an issue with which we must live and contend with. To say otherwise is to deceive ourselves and to embrace an outright lie. Evangelical and Wesleyan-based Pentecostal theology has always been an all-or-nothing proposition. We either live sinless and perfect, or we miss heaven. There are no gray areas, and there's no room for failure. We are constantly in a struggle to rise above the human condition and compare uh, complete with its weaknesses, failures, and faults, or else we are lost and diving headfirst into a devil's hell. The message and truth of grace is lost and holds no meaning for the believer past the altar of repentance. Grace plays a role, my friend, not only in our conversion, but it also plays a role in our ongoing security. But this is not the message we hear. And the message we hear is completely, entirely wrong. Ephesians 6 verses 5 through 8, Servants be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. You see, God's people do something the world doesn't do. We strive to do right. Hallelujah. We strive to do good. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9-12, through 12, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? 
Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Keeping this passage in context, we see the Apostle Paul begins by addressing the fact that some saints were going to court against other saints. And this, he said, was wrong. Saints will one day judge the angels. So matters that may require some kind of deliberation ought to be handled within the church, Paul said, and not in front of the world. Why would this be? Much like parents not arguing in front of their children or not disciplining their children in public, there are some matters which deserve to be kept private. Believers' failings should not be paraded by other believers before the world. We all have faults and failings, and if we all drag these issues out in open court, we make a mockery of our faith. Those who constantly engage in behaviors which are contrary to godliness are not going to inherit eternal life. But does this mean that those who are slated by God to inherit eternal life never commit sin? Not at all. The day is coming when the people of God shall be weighed in the balances. Did we spend our energy and effort trying to live right and do right? Or did we simply allow ourselves to do whatever it, it is we wish to do without any concern uh, for that, whether or not that which we were doing was right or wrong? Did we commit righteousness, meaning did we do right things? Unbelievers do not make the effort to do those things which are right to do otherwise known as righteousness. Right things include such matters as prayer, study, church attendance, tithing, etc. When we do these things, we are conducting ourselves entirely in a manner contrary to the manner in which unbelievers live. Even if we do at times fail and falter, in living a perfect and sinless life. I'm going to use this afternoon tithing as an example. I don't often do this, but I'm going to do it today. Malachi 3, 6 through 10. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers ye are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them return unto me and I will return unto you saith the Lord of hosts but ye said wherein shall we return will a man rob God yet ye have robbed me but ye say wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, 
if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. First Corinthians chapter 9, 13 and 14. Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. In other words, those who make the sacrifices eat the sacrifices. The priests would eat the, the meat that was offered in sacrifice, okay? Even so hath the Lord ordained. That this, this goes beyond the Lord suggesting. This goes beyond the Lord uh, instructing us. He has ordained, meaning He has forever established that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. The preacher of the gospel is supposed to make his living by reason of his ministry. That's how God ordained that things should be done. 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those, they, who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If there are behaviors and conduct which are deemed inappropriate or sinful, there must also be behaviors and conduct which are directly associated with righteousness, godliness, or simply right. Tithing is one of those tangible acts. It is a discipline which believers engage in as an act of righteousness. So when you tithe, this is an act of righteousness. This is one of the things you do that the world doesn't do. Why would the world do that? Well, I'll tell you, I remember I came out in 1989. I went back to Connecticut, my home state. I've been living in Texas. I went through a horrific experience. I won't take the time to tell the story again, but I went through a horrific experience. And I decided that's it. I can't live a lie anymore. I can't, I can't try to suppress who I am. I can't. I'm so lonely. I'm so depressed. I'm so despondent. I'm so discouraged. I mean, I was suicidal half the time. I was in a terrible frame of mind. I said, I can't do this anymore. I said, Lord, I'm sorry, I can't do this anymore. And I made up my mind I was going to be truthful and honest with myself. And I came out and I moved back up home to Connecticut. And that's where I first came out, so to speak. I, had, I was not doing things in the closet. I was not doing things in secret. But I just decided, okay, I'm going to pursue who I really am. I got a job. First job I got upon moving back to Connecticut was working as a car salesman at a local Ford dealer. Do you know, Tommy, I decided I was going to leave God. I was going to leave the church. I, you know, I wasn't going to have nothing to do because I was going to hell in a handbasket anyway. You know, the first thing I did when I got my paycheck, my first paycheck, You better believe it. I went and bought me a money order for 10% of my paycheck. And I sent it to my uh, friend of mine who pastored a church down here in Texas. Pentecostal church. I told him, I said, I moved back to, I moved back to Connecticut and everything. I, I started a new job. I said, but here's my tithe. I, I was so in the habit of tithing and I so believed in tithing that I just could not for the life of me break out of doing right. Hello now. Even though I was now technically backslid. Even though I was technically out of church. Even though now I was technically in sin. There were still right things that I knew were right. Because tithing is meant 
Now, it's meant to support the ministers, but at the same time, it is meant to express our appreciation and our gratitude to God for providing us with employment. If you don't appreciate having a job, try going through what Tommy and I have been going through now for almost a year. Maybe then you'll learn to get off your duff and be supportive of the man of God. Because I'm going to tell you something. You'll be out of work long enough, honey. All of a sudden, you'll appreciate it when you do get a job. But you see, tithing. In the Old Testament, Abraham tithed to the high priest Melchizedek. Why? Out of gratitude for what the Lord had done for him. Abraham gave Melchizedek the tithe strictly out of gratitude to God. I was a 10-year-old kid, got a paper route in my home state of Connecticut. Started delivering newspapers in my neighborhood. I'm going to tell you something. The first, the first collection day that I went around and collected everybody's money for their subscription, you know, and I paid my distributor his share and I was left with the balance you know that's my pay for delivering the papers do you know the first thing I did I was thrilled to death to do it I was thrilled out of my mind I was going to be able to type it tickled me I was thrilled I was a kid and it thrilled me because now I can support my church. Now I can support my pastor. Oh, it thrilled me. My whole life I felt that way. My whole life giving and supporting the work of God. And, so, and anybody who knows our church knows when we have ministers visiting our church, and our church has been so small for so many years, I've asked our people months in advance to start putting aside a little bit so that when these visiting ministers came we could give them a good offering didn't I tell you yep. I've asked our people I said please don't don't think about giving to Sean Thomas don't think about giving to acoustic souls don't think about giving to Sam Sampson don't think about giving to these different ones who've come and ministered for us don't think about giving to them only when they're standing in front of you. But let's think about giving to them in advance. Let's put a few pennies aside, whatever you can, so that when they come, we can give them as good an offering as we can possibly give them. Why do I do that? Because I know that God blesses givers. That's how it works. We do this we give, we tithe, we do acts of righteousness, not to be righteous, but because we are righteous. We do right because God has placed the seed of righteousness within us. And that seed manifests itself in our doing those things directly associated with right or righteousness. The same is true of prayer, studying the Word of God, church attendance, so on and so forth. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 15 through 19, See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit. Despise not prophesyings. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all 
appearance of evil. That's how God's people live. They struggle to do right. And the right that we do is viewed by the world and it is viewed by God as righteousness. When somebody sees you're faithful to the house of God, when somebody sees that you're faithful in doing the right things, they see your faith. They see how you live. I remember one time many, I was just a teenager living in Texas. And I used to go into this little uh, convenience store, gas station, restaurant combination out in East Texas where I was living. And I'd go in there and I, I would just go there because I lived by myself. I lived in a little trailer and uh, I didn't even have a dog. I, I lived by myself. I was lonely. You know, I hated being there by myself all the time. I was driving school bus during the day and everything. But, you know, so a lot of times in the evening, I'd go to this little store and gas station and restaurant affair. It was just a couple blocks down the road from me. And they had tables, you know, where you could sit. And they had quite a few of them, so I wouldn't take up tables. And I, I knew a lady that worked there in this shift. And she and I got along really well. She's a real sweet lady, a Baptist girl. We get along really well. And she didn't mind me coming in. I'd sit there and just read my Bible. And sometimes somebody walked past me by the table, you know, and I'd look up at them. And the Holy Ghost would speak to my heart. And the Lord would say to me, she is broken. She's, she's hurting. And I'd kind of tap the girl or whoever it was. I'd tap them and I'd say, Honey, I said, I, I'm a minister. I'd say, I hope you don't mind me saying this. I said, But I feel like the Lord told me that you're hurting. Something's going on and you're hurting. And all of a sudden, this girl just started to cry. <laughs> and I said, Sit down, sit down. Come on, let's talk about it. And I closed my Bible and I set it aside and I sat there and I held her hand and I talked to her for a while. And then I'd pray with her, you know, and then she'd leave with a smile on her face instead. Of... Now listen, when she walked in, she wasn't crying. She looked fine to the naked eye. But God knew something more was going on and He shared it with me. Well, I did this over and over. This would happen to me. I'd be talking to people, you know. And sometimes I just, you know me. Tommy knows me. I'll talk to anybody. I'm gregarious. Very outgoing, you know. And, and so I would just start talking to somebody. Next thing you know, they'd sit down and we'd get into these nice conversations, you know. And by the time we were done talking, they'd be encouraged and happy and, you know. And one day this little Baptist girl that worked in the... She wasn't that young. She was older than I was. At the time, I was probably all of 20, 21, something like that. And this lady that worked there, she's probably in her early 30s, maybe. And one time she said to me, she said, You know, Charles, she said, i got to tell you something. She said, I have never in my life ever seen anybody live the Christian life the way you live it. She said, I've never seen anybody lives like you live it. She said, if I've ever seen a Christian, I've seen a Christian looking at you. Now, I'm not saying that to blow my own horn. I'm saying that because that's what she told me. That touched my heart. But do you know what she saw, Tommy? She saw me doing right. Do you follow what I'm saying? That's all she saw. She didn't see me being anything special. She saw me doing right things. Trying to encourage people. Trying to help people. Trying to be a blessing to people. Do you follow what I'm telling you? That's what the world sees. See, the Bible said, man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh at the heart. People love to point to the fact that God looks at the heart so they can justify their wrongdoing. But they miss an important part of that passage. And that is the first line. Man looketh on the outward appearance. 
men can see your heart. All they can see is how you live and how you walk and how you talk and how you act and how you conduct yourself. This is one reason why in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, excuse me, verse 22, the Apostle Paul said, abstain from all appearance of evil. If you can avoid doing something that might be misconstrued as wrong, this is one reason why Tommy will tell you we don't live that far from Oak Lawn. Oak Lawn is our local neighborhood. I don't go into Oak Lawn by myself. If I need to go into Oak Lawn to do something, I usually will ask Tommy to go with me. I need to go to the drugstore. I need to go to this place or I need to go to that place. And I'll ask him to go with me. You say, well, Pastor, why won't you go by yourself? I'll tell you why. Because there was a famous preacher in Dallas years ago. I'll never forget it. And somebody said to me, do you know who I saw driving through, uh, you know, Oak Lawn the other day down here on, what's the name of that, Cedar Springs? I said, no, who? They said, oh, it was, and they named this preacher. Well, you know he was out cruising. Well, I don't know that. For all I know, he was driving from point A to point B. Oak Lawn is just outside of Love Field Airport. You know, for all I know, he was coming down Cedar Springs Road, coming from the airport. But do you see, people automatically are going to think evil of you if they see you coming down Cedar Springs Road. You follow what I'm saying? So what do I do? I avoid doing that. I don't go into bars. I don't go into nightclubs. Do I think people who go into those places are evil and wicked? And no, it's not that. I know that if I go there, sure as I'm alive, somebody's going to accuse me of doing something I'm not doing or claiming I'm doing something that I'm not doing and that my good will be evil spoken of. Therefore, I abstain from the very appearance of evil. I do everything in my power to avoid. Now, you cannot always avoid. There are times when things happen in such a way that somebody could steal. You know, your car could break down and you might have to walk into a, a bar room of course I'm thinking like it's 30 years ago you might have to go through a bar room to use their pay phone and that's the only reason you went into that bar room you know what I'm saying there are times things happen when you can't really uh, abstain from the appearance of evil people if they're going to think evil they're going to think evil but for the most part part of doing good uh, is abstaining from the appearance of evil. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? I'm almost done today, folks. In Hebrews chapter 10, 25, the Word of God said, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, which means encouraging, uplifting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. In 1 John 3.14, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Honey, if you can't love your fellow believer, I can walk into a church on the other side of the planet, a church I've never been in in my life. I remember as a kid, my grandparents used to take us occasionally on little trips. My, my, my grandfather's family was from Maine, and sometimes he'd take us up to Maine. You know, it's a long trip from Connecticut, about 12 hours or so. And we'd go up to Maine, and when we were out of town, my grandma and my grandpa, we were going to go to church, even if we were out of town. And so we'd go to church, maybe it was the church my aunt went to, or my, my cousins went to, or whatever. And you know what, I didn't know one person in that place, all I knew is they loved Jesus, and I love Jesus, and that means I love you too. Amen. I can love God's people, I don't care if I know them or I don't know them. 
I don't care if I fully agree with them or I don't agree with them. One of the things that makes some people ticked off at this apostolic one God Jesus name preacher is that I can go into a Trinitarian Pentecostal church and I can fellowship with those folks and I can love those folks and I can be kind to those folks and I can interact with those folks and, and not have a single problem doing it. You know why? Because we know we pass from life and from death unto life when we love the brethren. Anybody that loves my Jesus, I, I can love back. Amen. I don't have to agree with them 100%. I don't have to be in perfect doctrinal lockstep with them in order to love them. John chapter 13 verse 35 By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. All or nothing theology ignores the reality of reward. Believers are to be rewarded according to their conduct. Everything is not heaven or hell. Some issues are merely a matter of being worthy of reward or not being worthy of reward. You hear what I'm telling you? It's not about heaven or hell. It's about, well, you had an opportunity to do something you'd be rewarded for and you passed up on that opportunity. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? So it's not, everything is not black or white. Everything is not as it reads, so to speak. No, some things are not as simple as black and white. In Matthew 16, 27, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then He shall reward every man according to His works. In Revelation 22 and 12, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. John 5, 28 and 29, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. As children of God, we can take comfort in the knowledge that doing our best is not only the best we can do, but it is also all that the Lord asks of us. He does not demand that we somehow achieve sinless perfection so that we can make heaven our home and one day see Him in eternity. He asks that we make the effort to do right, to do those things which are defined as righteousness, as evidence of our relationship with and our faith in God in appreciation of His grace and His goodness toward us. Our primary text today said, 1 John 3, 1 and 2, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. For those who read the Word of God simplistically, for those who read the Word of God legalistically I have a little revelation for you today it is not as simple as black and white amen praise the name of the Lord let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time